If you built this dinosaur using the biology of any animal alive today, it would not walk. It would not breathe. It would not survive an hour. According to physics, this creature should not exist. Look at it. This is the dinosaur we all drew in kindergarten. The classic long neck, the gentle giant, the most familiar animal in prehistoric history. But biologically speaking, this dinosaur is a lie. If you took a real living animal and simply scaled it up to the size of an Argentinosaurus or a Patagotitan using the biology of a lizard or a mammal, it would not just be slow. Its legs would collapse under its own weight. Its bones would fail like dry twigs. Its body would trap heat until it cooked itself alive from the inside out. And before it could even take a second breath, it would suffocate on its own carbon dioxide. For more than a century, paleontologists faced a brutal physics problem. It's called the square cube law. As an animal gets bigger, its volume and mass increase far faster than its surface area. Strength, cooling, breathing, everything that keeps an animal alive fails at extreme size. At 70 or 80 tons, a sauropod is not just large. It is pushing the absolute upper limit of what life should be able to do on land. So how did they exist at all? How did nature engineer an animal that did not just stretch biology, but appeared to break the laws of physics that constrain every other land creature on Earth? The answer is not that they had stronger bones. It's not that they ate more food. And it's not that physics was somehow different back then. The real secret is far stranger. These animals were not built like solid giants. They were built like structures like machines. They were quite literally mostly empty space. Today, we're going to look inside the air hulks of the Mesozoic. We're going to dismantle this familiar childhood dinosaur and rebuild it piece by piece using the bioengineering innovations that allowed sauropods to dominate the planet for over 140 million years. Let's start with the chassis, the skeleton. If you look at an elephant, the largest land animal today, its bones are incredibly dense. They have to be solid columns to support six tons of weight. Now imagine scaling that elephant up to 70 tons. If a sauropod had the solid bones of an elephant, its skeleton alone would be so heavy, the animal would not be able to stand up, let alone walk. It would be a statue trapped by gravity. Evolution had to solve a budget problem. Bone is expensive. It costs minerals to grow and energy to move. So sauropods stopped building walls and started building bridges. When we scan sauropod vertebrae, specifically the neck and torso, we do not find solid blocks. We find an intricate webbing of laminates and struts. It looks less like biological bone and more like the internal truss work of a crane boom or a steel bridge. This is a biological marvel called skeletal pneumaticity. In some giant titanosaurs, up to 60% or even 70% of the volume of their vertebrae was just air. But here is the engineering genius, they did not lose strength. By placing bone material only along the lines of stress where gravity was actually pulling, they maintained maximum structural integrity while shedding tons of dead weight. Think of it like the difference between a solid brick and a modern I-beam. The I-beam is mostly empty space, but it can hold up a skyscraper. Sauropods were biological skyscrapers built with I-beams, but nature does not just leave empty holes. That would be structurally unstable and prone to infection. Those hollow spaces were not just empty, they were occupied. They were the housing for a pressurized system that leads us directly to the true secret of their power. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, they had light bones, but what about breathing? Giraffes have long necks and they breathe just fine. This brings us to the dead space problem. When you breathe in fresh air, travels down your trachea to your lungs. When you breathe out, the stale air full of carbon dioxide travels back up. But here's the catch, a portion of that stale air never leaves your windpipe. It gets stuck in the dead space. On your next inhale, you drag that stale air back into your lungs before the fresh air can get there. For a human or even a giraffe, this is manageable. But imagine you have a neck that is 10 or 12 meters long. The volume of dead space in that windpipe would be enormous. 
If a sauropod breathed like us in and out tidal breathing, it would pass out from CO2 poisoning within minutes. It would just be re-inhaling its own exhaust fumes. So they did not breathe like us. They breathed like machines, or rather they breathed like birds. Sauropods utilized a unidirectional respiratory system. They did not just have lungs. They had a massive network of air sacs distributed throughout their entire body, invading their chest cavity, their abdomen. And yes, hollowing out those vertebrae we talked about. Here is the engineering brilliance. It's a four stroke engine. Stroke one, inhale. Air bypasses the lungs and goes to the rear air sacs. Stroke two, exhale. That air is pushed forward through the lungs gas exchange happens here. Stroke three, inhale again. The air moves from the lungs to the front air sacs. Stroke four, exhale again. The stale air is finally pushed out of the body. This means two incredible things. First, fresh oxygen rich air is constantly flowing over the lung tissue, both when the animal inhales and when it exhales. They were extracting oxygen with an efficiency that puts mammals to shame. Second, those air sacs invading the neck bones acted like internal balloons, keeping the neck pressurized and light. They were not just animals. They were living rigid airship balloons. That is how you build a 12 meter neck without suffocating. We have built a light skeleton. We have installed a high performance engine. Now we face the most dangerous invisible enemy heat. Everything alive generates heat. Your metabolism is a slow burning fire. Small animals lose heat fast because they have a lot of skin compared to their insides. But sauropods, they are on the opposite end of the spectrum. They are massive heat traps. Due to the square cube law, a 70 ton animal has a massive internal volume generating heat, but relatively little skin surface to let it out. This is the phenomenon of gigantothermy. If they had the high octane metabolism of a modern mammal without a cooling system, their core temperature could rise until their organs failed. They would literally cook from the inside out. So why did not they melt? Remember those air sacs, they were not just for breathing. They acted as an internal liquid cooling system. The intricate network of air pockets touching the organs and deep inside the bones allowed for internal evaporation. Every breath was dumping a massive amounts of waste heat out of the body, functioning exactly like a car's radiator. And then there is the neck. We usually assume the long neck evolved solely to reach the highest branches like a giraffe. And for species like Brachiosaurus, that's true. But for many others like Diplodocus, the neck served a different purpose. It was not a crane, it was a suspension bridge. It allowed them to stand in one spot and sweep a massive area of vegetation mowing down entire forests without wasting a single step. But biologically, that neck performed another miracle. It was a massive thermal radiator. By increasing the body's surface area without adding heat generating organs like a stomach or liver inside it, the neck allowed blood to circulate away from the hot core, cool down in the breeze and return to the body. Nature did not just solve one problem with the neck. It solved three unmatched feeding efficiency, respiratory piping and critical thermoregulation. It is the Swiss army knife of vertebrate anatomy. But there is one final hurdle, the elephant problem. To get this big mammals like elephants have to invest heavily in their young. An elephant is pregnant for 22 months and has one calf. If the calf dies, it's a tragedy for the genetic line. The population grows incredibly slowly. If sauropods did this, they would have gone extinct the moment a large predator evolved or the climate shifted. But sauropods did not act like big mammals. They acted like giant sea turtles. Because they laid eggs, they were not constrained by the size of a womb. But more importantly, because they had bird-like physiology, they could lay lots of eggs. We have found nesting grounds in Argentina with thousands of unhatched eggs. Here is the genius of the R strategy at a massive scale. A mother sauropod could drop a clutch of 30 or 40 eggs, bury them and walk away.
She did not have to waste energy nursing them or protecting them. Sure, 95% of those babies would get eaten. They were bite-sized snacks for everything in the Jurassic. But if you lay 400 eggs in your lifetime, you only need one to survive to replace you. This allowed sauropod populations to bounce back from disasters incredibly fast. It allowed them to colonize new continents rapidly. And it created the most extreme growth spurt in the history of life. A hatchling titanosaur weighed about as much as a house cat. In just 15 to 20 years, it would weigh more than a Boeing 737. That is a weight increase of 10,000 times. Imagine a human baby growing to be the size of a cruise ship. To fuel that growth, they did not chew. They did not have the teeth for it. They just stripped branches, leaves, twigs and all, and swallowed them whole, letting a massive fermentation vat in their stomach do the work. They were walking industrial vacuums, processing energy as fast as possible to fuel that explosive growth. When we look at this dinosaur, we usually see something clumsy, slow, primitive, a relic that got lucky until it did not. But that picture is wrong. Sauropods were not evolutionary accidents. They were not oversized failures waiting to collapse. They were the most successful large land animals in the history of Earth. For over 100 million years, they dominated every continent. They survived shifting climates, rising oxygen levels, falling oxygen levels, and the evolution of predators specifically built to kill giants. They did not persist because they were strong. They persisted because they were engineered. They built skeletons out of air. They breathed like turbines. They cooled themselves from the inside out. They turned low quality plants into muscle at an industrial scale. These were not just animals scaled up. They were biological systems optimized to the absolute edge of what physics allows. And that's the most important takeaway. Physics did not fail. Biology did not cheat. Nature solved the problem elegantly, efficiently, and relentlessly. Sauropods did not disappear because they were bad at being animals. They disappeared because something unprecedented happened. A rock the size of Manhattan struck the planet set the atmosphere on fire, collapsed food chains worldwide, and ended an era that had lasted longer than mammals have existed at all. Until that very specific, very unlucky day, the air hulks were unstoppable. If you want to understand what finally brought down the most perfectly optimized giants the planet has ever seen, we break down the asteroid impact minute by minute in the next video. And if you want to support deep dive science storytelling like this, you can find the links below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.